You're hired on as an offensive cybersecurity specialist, and you're about to start your very first red team engagement. Here, you'll be tasked with emulating a real world hacking group so that your company can better prepare against cyber attacks. You're super excited to get started. And after all that hard work and studying, you're finally getting to do this for real. You start by setting up your attack infrastructure. You decide that you'll need to use a C2 and you choose Havoc C2. Eagerly, you jump right in and you set it up as quickly as possible using some documentation that you found online. A C2 or command and control is the number one most commonly used tool by hackers once they compromise an organization. And the reason that we call it command and control is because it's what allows attackers to remotely control PCs and servers that they have hacked. After scouring LinkedIn to find IT administrators at the company that you're targeting and carefully crafting your malicious Microsoft Word document, you were finally able to hack your way in and you are absolutely ecstatic. However, However, after just 30 minutes, receive a message from Cyber Defense. You've been detected and your operation is over. So how is this possible in the first place? Well, as Cyber Defense has leveled up, we can no longer use these C2 frameworks with the default settings out of the box and expect to avoid detection. In this video, we are going to use the free and open source Havoc C2 framework and dive into which settings you'll need to change to ensure that we can avoid these detections. Now, before we dive into this, I wanna let you know if you are learning this red teaming stuff and you wanna become a red teamer, definitely send me a DM to my Instagram at Elevate Cyber with the word red team video. That way I know you came from this video and we can give you some guidance on how to best go about doing that really optimize what you're learning uh, to prepare for that. Now, with Havoc, we ran everything out of the box. What are the implications of that? Well, first of all, what we're going to take a look at is some of the settings from the profile. So we can see when we ran the C2 server, what settings did we run it with? So if we take a look at the command line where we started this up, there is a file called havoc.yaotl. And the reason we know that we're using that, by the way, is when we ran our server, we specify the profile. This is the default Havoc profile. Now these profiles, that's what shapes the traffic of how the beacon from the compromised server will interact with our C2 server. So that is all dictated here in the profile. So if we take a look at the profile that we're using here, we see a lot of defaults. For one thing we see the default username and passwords. And this is one that I added custom, but this one was already there. So actually if some kind of security investigator found our C2 server, they could try these default credentials and possibly log in to our C2 server. And then we'd be beyond burned at that point. So we really would like to avoid that. But also we're running the C2 server on the default port 456. This is the default Havoc port. We definitely want to change that and not use that. That could be a really easy indicator for the defense. Now, Another thing that we don't really see here is we can also shape the different headers and things like that. We can make it so that uh, only the operators can t uh, even find our C2 server. And if it's not them based on the header, it sends them to some legitimate looking site. So that's something that we can do as well. We want to modify this sleep and jitter because it's going to run every two seconds and call back to our C2 server. Obviously, that's going to be super chatty on the network, is, which is something that we're going to see in just a second when we look at this in Wireshark. Now, what else did we do wrong when we hastily set up this C2 server out of the box? Well, it started with the payload generation. So if we go to our C2 server here, with the payloads, I was just running all the defaults, right? So I clicked, hey, attack payload here. And this is all the defaults here. We didn't make use of one of the greatest strengths of Havoc, and that is sleep obfuscation to help bypass some detections. And we have a lot of different techniques that we can use for that. Uh, we didn't really make use of AMC or ETW patching to bypass some of the default Windows detections. Uh, we could also play around with some of the injection types here, though I will say native syscall is a pretty good option here, but that is the one we went with. But yeah, there's basically a lot that we're leaving on the table. We want to, in a real engagement, adjust the sleep and jitter timing and make it less chatty on the network, like I said. And also, we generated a just regular Windows executable, so we had to write to disk. Maybe we'd want to run it in memory or something like that. We could generate some Windows shell code and run it within another process, like a loader, to actually load this in memory, maybe a PowerShell 
loader or something like that. Or we could go for a DLL and do some DLL hijacking maybe on like Microsoft Teams or something like that. There's a lot of ways that we could have made it more stealthy just off the bat here. And I will say for this demo, I you know, just did everything default. And that means that this no longer, you know, when this first came out, you could just do it like this it would bypass Windows antivirus. Well, now the vendors have gotten more wise to that, obviously, as is the natural course of things. So we would need to, in a real scenario, apply some kind of antivirus bypass, maybe even EDR bypass as well, if there's an EDR in the target environment, which definitely could be the case in a corporate environment, right? So those are a few considerations. Now, next thing we want to look at is things like the TLS certificate. So if we run an Nmap, we can find the TLS certificate information. So that's what I've done here. I've ran an Nmap scan against this, and we can see some default TLS certificates. Now, we'd also want to run, and we also want to run this Nmap scan against the listener as well. You know, here I ran it against port 456, but we also would want to run this against port 443 and uh, yeah, basically port 443 with the SSL to see their SSL cert. Uh, but we see here, this is default tech Inc in Arizona, US, all that. This is a little bit more stealthy, I will say, than something like Covenant C2. But if you're savvy to this, and let's be honest, the defense is always leveling up. If they don't know it yet, they eventually will know, hey, this is default Havoc C2 behavior. So you want to generate your own certs and ideally you don't even do self-signed certs. You go and get a real SSL certificate. That is the most stealthy way to go about it. But either way, you would definitely want to be modifying this as well. Now, the other consideration here is the HTTP headers. So if we take a look at say curl, we can do a curl request against the server so something like um, something like this. We can run this command, submit a post request to our server. And this time I'm doing it against one of our listeners here. We can see some interesting headers. One thing, the default Nginx header could be a bit of a giveaway. But what really gives it away is this custom header here, X Havoc. So that is a default for Havoc that we'd want to modify. Now, how do we modify that? Well, simply by using an, our own custom Havoc profile, our own custom malleable C2 profile and not the default. So that would uh, correct that issue. So this is an easy, low-hanging fruit way the defense can fingerprint this as a Havoc C2 server. But that's not all. We can also on the target, see if we run like a netstat command or if we have some kind of security software that can look at our network connections, we can see some interesting things here. We see two established connections to an IP address that actually in this case is our C2 server. Now this is a big no-no because in the real world, we wanna use what is called an HTTP redirector, probably multiple of them to be honest, that way, they will not know the IP address of our C2 server. They'll just see the redirector. So if they say, hey, what's this IP address here of this redirector, they could just, um, they would IP ban that and we could just use a different redirector. Uh, maybe even we want to use a two C2 servers, a short haul and a long haul server as well. So if they do somehow catch our short haul C2 server where we're performing most of our commands, we'll still have another connection, another way in through the long haul server that could set up another connection through the short haul. So that's something I would recommend to research as well. But just off the cuff here, having our IP address exposed to them is a really bad thing. We'd want to use a redirect route that would then redirect our traffic to the C2 server and also kind of lock that down through a server header or something so not anyone can see what, you know, go to that redirector and find our C2 server. It would serve them a legitimate looking page if it was someone else, like I was saying. So... That's the first thing, easily detectable here and bannable, IP bannable, right? And the other thing uh, that is an issue here is that um, if we take a look at the fact that this is just a, you know, we're just using the IP address here. We're not using any kind of DNS. Ideally, you want a domain name for your, uh, for your redirectors, C2 servers, stuff like that, so that it looks like a legitimate site. You want to ideally a well-established domain name that looks like it's it's been around for a while. It looks more legitimate, not like you just spun it up for this engagement like a week ago. So that is the ideal case to make this truly stealthy. You want it looking as legitimate as a website as you possibly can get it. And 
Another thing that we're leaking here is actually the default user agent um, that we're just using out of the box here. So if we take a look at our Wireshark, we can do a Wireshark capture. And what I'm gonna capture is I'm gonna do a filter here. I'm gonna say IP address is equal to our target and TCP port we'll say is equal to port 80. And the reason that I have 443 and 80 both here it might be kind of interesting. Like, why do you do that? Well, in a real corporate environment, even SSL traffic is typically going to be decrypted by the company at their endpoint. So even though you'll be using uh, SSL, they'll be they'll have the capabilities of decrypting that at the endpoints, like their edge devices, like routers and stuff like that. And the reason for that is they they have security tools that can inspect the traffic and look for malicious activity and stuff like that. So even if you're using HTTPS, they'll be decrypting that most likely. So just to kind of simulate that, I have also uh, have it going in the clear text. So if I go on the session here that I have and run some kind of command, like a simple command like ipconfig, and I capture this traffic, here's what we'll see. We come here, I can stop the, the capture here. If we take one of these and I right click and say follow the HTTP stream, we can see all these keep alives because remember this sucker is running every two seconds checking back and making that connection. So that it's really chatty, like I said, we can see all these requests coming through. Now we'll see one that has a lot of data. That will be the output of our IP config command. So we just scroll down a little bit. We should see this here. Yeah, this right here. Now this is just octet stream encoded. So a savvy defender can decode this and, and see in plain text likely the output of our IP config command or whatever the attacker tried to do. But yeah, this is not really encrypted, it's encoded. Uh, but yeah, you can see what the traffic looks like here. And you can also see the user agent header, like I said, this right here. Now, the untrained eye, this, not, this might not look like much, but remember, we're in some cases dealing with some pretty sophisticated defenders here. If I Google search like um, user agent lookup, we can easily look this up. And what we find is that this user agent corresponds to Chrome 96 on Windows 7. Well, today... Not many companies are running Windows 7 devices, so this could stand out. It could be automated, like automatically flagged. Also, the current version of Chrome is, I believe, 119 at the time of this recording. So this really sticks out as the out-of-date user agent. It wouldn't really make sense in a lot of environments. So if we actually even look at our targets over here, well, for one thing, this is Windows 10. But for another thing, it doesn't even have Chrome installed. So this could be very fishy behavior that could be easily detected with some good detection rules which some, uh, some environments might have, some cybersecurity teams might have that. We definitely hope they do, right? So that is another thing we'd want to modify and not just use right out of the box here. So these are the main things. And if you want to get really sweaty, this is a little bonus for you. If you want to get really sweaty with this stuff, you also want to look at what are the Yara rules out there? What are some of the detection rules for Havoc that other people have written? So we could take a look at that. I have here malpedia.com here, or I guess this weird website, not really a .com website, but Malpedia, and they have some Yara rules that were written to detect Havoc C2. Now, the reason this is significant is other companies, if they want to detect Havoc, they're probably just going to find someone else's Yara rules rather than writing them custom, and they're just going to pull this down. So if you know what the rules to detect this are, you can modify your version of Havoc in order to bypass these common detections that a lot of companies are going to use. The first one is a static-based detection here where they have just simply... Um, some strings that it's looking for in the binary that you can modify if you modify that binary. And when I say binary, I'm talking about the generated payloads. So like when these payloads are ran, it's going to run a, your YAR rules against them and look for certain hard-coded strings. If you can basically modify your payloads either after you generate them or generate them custom, then you're going to be able to avoid these static detections of the static string detections. These are the, this is the easiest one to bypass. The second one, a little bit tougher. Uh, it Basically, without getting too in the weeds here as much as possible, uh, the default behavior on what we chose here when we generated our payload was to use what is called API hashing. So rather than making direct calls to the APIs, which would then show up in our import address table, which a defender can look at and see which um, DLLs we're calling, which libraries we're using. We're actually using a technique called API hashing to resolve the, uh, the syscalls here uh, and 
basically it's the by an anti forensics a kind of like bypass technique and an evasion technique to uh, make these li- load these libraries without having it show up in the import address table. Well, they've been able to fingerprint that and and figure out what the syscall hashes are. So to avoid this, we would probably have to honestly generate our own payloads outside of using Havoc and just do it custom to avoid that. And the next one is a really tricky one to bypass as well. Uh, they're looking at the hashing routines of DLLs and shellcode. In our case, we use DXE, so this wouldn't be affected. But if we use DLL or shellcode, this is the technique they would use to identify the hashing routine that Havoc uses. So again, we would probably want to custom generate our payloads if we know they're using these YAR rules in their environment. But yeah, things can get pretty sweaty here, as you might imagine. But I wanted to include this as well for your awareness. Now, hopefully you guys are enjoying this. If you want to figure out how do I set up and install Havoc C2 framework. Well, I made a video on that earlier last year. So go ahead and check out that video next. But yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. Let me know in the comments section if you have any questions. And yeah, thanks for watching.